was uh, down, was down earlier, uh, but appears that it's back up and the link to the calendar, the city calendar is working fine. So if there was a uh, an email blast that went out, maybe it's worth sending a revised link. Yep, I'm happy to do that to the folks that I'd reached out to. So I'll do that right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Samara, this is this will be recorded. Um, uh, it is always uh, uh, unfortunate when we we have a tech problem. Uh, let's see if we can get this out to as many people as we can. If we figure out some folks are struggling, but I think it's good to note we can note early on here that we will make the recording of the recording will be available too if people wanted to uh, revisit it after too. Absolutely. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, one of the panel, one of the one of the attendees is saying they can only see me, um, but I'm hopeful that the panel is set up as it should be, and um, maybe there's a way for you to click on the right up top of, of your Zoom browser and click on View. Um, we have 28 people in attendance right now, and I did resend the link out. Great, thank you. And I think it's worth maybe it's worth noting. You just mentioned this, Smart, but just to uh, go in a little deeper in case um, I know many people are familiar with this, but not everyone's on this all the time. There's a there's the upper right of the screen will have a view. Uh, button if you hover up there with your mouse uh, that will give you different options for who you see on the screen. Uh, so just restating that in case that helps anyone uh, see the whole the whole team. And I'll just throw in that if you're on your phone, uh, you can swipe. Uh, there should be arrows to get different views uh, of multiple people at once versus just one person. So Uh, isn't it lovely to be doing Zoom meetings still? <laughs> yes, thanks for everyone's patience. <laughs> I will say, as long as we're <clears throat> still getting ready, uh, when we were contemplating this meeting in the summer, coming off the, the first meeting we had, we, we, we were anticipating this would be a, a, a real live event in person. Um, and uh, we're not quite there yet, but it felt real close. Uh, so still feeling hopeful we'll, we'll do those again, but uh, glad we have these tools. <clears throat> uh, 
Are we, uh, we able to get started or are we still doing some um, troubleshooting there? I'm all set on my end here, although I'm hopeful, William, that the Harbor Master was able to join us. Okay. He's here, okay, great. Why don't, well, I'll, uh, I'll start. Um, first of all, I wanna uh, welcome everyone. Thank you all again uh, for your patience. We're gonna start a few minutes late here. Um, good evening and, I, and welcome to this public meeting on Portland Harbor Common phase one. Thank you to everyone who's taken time out of your evening to be here. Uh, I'm Christine Grimondo. I'm the Director of Planning and Urban Development. I am joined by a number of other um, city staff this, this evening. Um, with us, Parks, Recreation and Facilities Director, Ethan Hipple, Samara Ray, also with Parks Department, uh, helping us moderate uh, and, and, uh, and do other things this evening. Bill Needeman, our Waterfront Coordinator with the Housing and Economic Development Committee uh, Department is here with us as well. Also here, not uh, city staff, but uh, important partner is Nan Cummings. She is the executive director of Portland Parks Conservancy. Um, and tonight we're gonna have, we have a presentation. Uh, maybe it's a good time to, to share that uh, when you're ready. Um, and I'll, I'll get started. We're, we're, gonna, we're here to discuss um, the phase one of a concept for the future of the Eastern Waterfronts open spaces. And we had a meeting this summer introducing a broader Portland Harbor Common vision and initiative, um, and um, as well as some sort of preliminary thoughts on phase one. Uh, and tonight we're revisiting phase one, uh, we, what we've heard so far, next steps. There's also, um, we're gonna highlight some other activities and, and context for the Eastern Waterfront as well. And we'll leave plenty of time for questions and comments. So with that, we're gonna start um, with, um, if we can move to the next slide, I'm gonna ask Nan if she could give an overview of the works of Portland Parks Conservancy um, and, and their relationship to this work, that would be great. Take it away. You're on mute, Nan, when you, when you have a moment. There we go, isn't that always the way? Um, so yes, I am the director of the Portland Parks Conservancy. We are a relatively new nonprofit. Um, so if you haven't heard of us, that's okay. We were launched at the end of 2018 and really got going in 2019. Um, we have a very simple mission and that is to enhance Portland's public parks and recreational programs by raising money and engaging the community. So what that basically means is we raise money for things that the Parks and Rec Department would like to do, but is not in the current city budget. So those extras. Um, and it's all described in a um, memorandum of understanding that we signed with the city that really describes in detail our partnership and those fundraising roles. Um, so as you can imagine, the city has lots of needs. Um, Ethan has big dreams. Um, so our organization, our board of directors, created a um, list of values that really help guide what kinds of projects we want to get involved in. And the values are things like park equity, access, inclusion, sustainability, and collaboration. So some of our past projects just in the last couple of years that we've gotten involved with, um, the Talbot School Playground, um, the idea was to create a really ADA inclusive playground where all the kids could play together on accessible um, facilities. So we helped raise the extra money to make that happen. Um, we helped launch the Portland Youth Corps. We raised all private funding to launch that program, which just um, had its first year last this past summer. Um, that gives young teens um, mentoring and their first job experience as they work in the parks and they raise some money, or they, they uh, make some money as well. Um, so it's a wonderful program that really helps those young kids. Um, we also have gotten involved with Riverton Trolley Park. Um, it's an underused park in what's considered an underserved neighborhood. Um, so last spring, we launched a public process to help learn from the community 
what folks wanted in, in Riverton Trolley Park. And now that we have that basic information, we've created a plan with the city and we've started to raise some money for that. Um, and finally, our other big uh, project right now is engaging volunteers in park work, especially after COVID hit the city budget so hard and really impacted the Parks and Rec Department budget especially. We created a volunteer program to help do our part to maintain the parks, to, to do those extras that, um, that volunteers can really be so helpful with. So we have an ongoing volunteer program. Um, why are we involved with this project? Really, it's to create access um, for the people of Portland to enjoy their waterfront, especially um, in an area that's being increasingly built up, um, as, as we all recognize, I think. Um, so we're going to basically be involved in two ways. We're going to be part of the public process going forward, especially in engaging our fellow um, nonprofit stakeholders. And uh, we're going to be launching a fundraising campaign and raising the private dollars uh, to make this a reality. So you will certainly be hearing more from us as this moves forward, and uh, we're all really looking forward to it. Great, thank you. That's 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 a super overview. I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna move on. Um, to some background, uh, I mentioned we're talking about phase one, but I, I'm going to provide a little bit. We're, we're going to provide a little, a um, little bit of other context for the area this evening. And and briefly, I just want to touch on the sort of decades of work that has gone on in this area. Um, I, I'd be remiss in not noting it, um, not just because uh, planners like talking about uh, big planning initiatives. Uh, and because I do, these, I think these are wonder, wonderful efforts that have taken place over the years and really informed uh, much of what we see uh, happening uh, in the Eastern Waterfront right now. Some elements of that work has, have come to fruition, some have not. Uh, some, some things have shifted uh, down there as well in terms of um, uh, certain priorities, but there are elements of those efforts that really inform a lot of what we're talking about today, including uh, the phase one area we're going to uh, get to, has been identified as a, sort of a critical piece of public waterfront land uh, and potential future open space at various times in the past, too. So I think a lot of this work, um, it doesn't preclude us having new conversations, but it certainly um, is uh, sort of a valuable sort of store of decades of, of input and thinking about uh, this area. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is what I call, at least to myself and, and now to you, my Eastern Waterfront Russian Dolls uh, slide, because there's a lot, um, there's a lot sort of nested within, uh, with, uh, within other things down here. And I'm going to walk through what this is. And the reason why um, this is here is because we're going to be talking about a, a, a numerous areas and studies uh, initiatives down here. And I thought um, that sort of framing what we're talking about and where it is would be a valuable uh, start to this conversation. Uh, and then as we move through uh, the presentation, as we switch locations, a, uh, a version of this sort of highlighting the area we're talking, we're talking about will, will pop up just to help orient us as we, as we go. Um, so there's some areas highlighted here. When we speak about the Eastern Waterfront in this context, from a planning perspective, from the city's sort of short, shorthand for Eastern Waterfront area of the city and planning efforts, it is generally, and these are not sort of precise boundaries, um, but generally encompassed by the extent of that what, uh, light dashed area, which is the largest extent here, uh, goes from uh, Franklin, to uh, the farthest edge of the Portland Company until the sort of uh, to where the, the Eastern Prom picks up, which is not considered the Eastern Waterfront as we're speaking about it uh, today. Um, the uh, blue box is the area of the Portland Harbor Common concept. Uh, and it is, goes from um, Franklin or about Main, or Main State Pier uh, over to the end of the city's property, uh, end of the Amethyst lot, uh, before turning into the uh, Portland Company site or the Portland Foresight site, uh, which is outside of that boundary. Um, yellow is uh, the 
area of the Portland Landing Plan. That was a 2017 uh, planning initiative for this area that we're gonna talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, and it goes uh, from Ocean Gateway to, uh, to the east to uh, encompass Amethyst a lot as well uh, and the end of city property to the east. Um, phase one is indicated by a circle in red to the west and left of that. Um, and you know, I left out one. I'm gonna go back east. There's a purple box within that bigger yellow box that is the amethyst lot as well. And then I've pointed out uh, several uh, landmarks and important uh, spots, including a um, proposed pier spot, Ocean Gateway and some other landmarks down there as well. Um, next, please. So with that, we'll move on to the locust. This is for the Portland Landing Project that I, uh, that I mentioned uh, in yellow. And I'm gonna pass the mic uh, to Ethan Hippel to talk a little bit about that. Great, thank you, Christine. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Ethan Hippel. I'm the director of the Parks, Rec, and Facilities Department. Uh, good to be here talking about this uh, project. Um, so Portland Landing uh, is something uh, Bill Needleman and I and many others, uh, city staff as well as stakeholders, um, worked on this uh, in 2016 and 2017. It was a close to two year process. Um, and uh, focusing on the area that you see here outlined in yellow. So including what's Moon Tide Park in front of Ocean Gateway, um, uh, and uh, as well as the uh, what's known as the Amethyst lot, which is the area in the upper right of the uh, yellow square there, which also includes uh, city land that Sale Maine is currently located on and was located on then as well. Um, so if we can advance a slide. Um, that process uh, took place uh, over two years, 2016 and 2017. I believe we published our report um, and kind of initial uh, preferred design concepts in December of 2017. If anybody's interested in this, by the way, we have this um, on our website still, uh, and it will likely uh, be part of discussions moving forward because a lot of the things that uh, the public um, weighed in on and, and the design team uh, put onto paper uh, are likely going to be things that we uh, want in, in this new space that we're talking about tonight. Um, so the images you see here are uh, in this slide are from a, a result of some of the public input and public forums that we held um, during this two year process. Uh, and we were looking at different park amenities and programming elements and uh, um, and seeing what people liked and didn't like uh, in, in these images, you can see green dots. And that means that, you know, participants were given green stickers to put up and they, they liked those things. And you can see things like uh, sailboats and, uh, you know, open space by the water and, and uh, walking paths have a lot of green dots next to them. Um, and, uh, you know, and so that process, that public process uh, is, um, I just wanted to go into that a little bit about what we did. We had a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, stakeholder meetings as well as stakeholder uh, community meetings um, with groups like Portland Trails, uh, uh, Sail Main, Main Narrow Gauge Railway, um, the Harbor Commission, Ripple Effect, uh, Munjoy Hill Neighborhood Association and other neighborhood associations. So those folks were all invited to be part of the process. And then we had uh, multiple um, public forums like this uh, along the way, and uh, as, as well as presentations to the Parks Commission and to the Economic Development Committee of the Council, City Council. Um, so through all of the, that public input uh, during the Portland Landing process, uh, we heard from the public some key things, and I'm not going to go into all of them here, but the, I think it's important to note uh, what we've heard before about, you know, developing space in the waterfront for green space. Um, you know, number one, public access and making sure it's accessible uh, to all, including those with disabilities, um, you know, space for community boating. Uh, this, you know, when we were discussing Portland Landing, uh, you know, Sail Maine was uh, already a tenant on city land um, and a partner of ours. And uh, so, you know, that was something that was worked into that plan. Um, space for access to Fort Gorges. Um, and so there were uh, shown on the plans docks and, uh, you know, places where boats could get back and forth to Fort Gorges and the other islands. 
um, and neighborhoods of Portland. Uh, desire for native plants and trees, uh, playful elements, uh, places to sit and connect, you know, lawn areas, um, multi-purpose hardscape. So a place, we didn't want to turn it into a parking lot, but uh, places that uh, where people could park or that we could use for um, events, uh, you know, food truck plazas, um, small scale events, et cetera. Uh, access to the water, direct access to water. So not only being able to look at the water, but being able to touch the water um, was a big uh, key thing that we heard. Um, temporary birthing for boaters and islanders to come and be able to shop and, uh, you know, tie up a boat for a couple hours and do their business and then get back home. Um, and coastal resiliency, that was a big focus. Uh, and it still is a big focus of the city is making sure our shoreline is resilient. And so that's something that we heard a lot about. Uh, can you jump to the next screen, Samara? So after hearing all that, this is the uh, final um, pr uh, proposed alternative or preferred alternative. Uh, there were numerous iterations of this going forward. Uh, and this is kind of what we had come up with as a city <clears throat> after hearing all the input um on uh you know what would be in that space so this was an ambitious plan uh it had an estimated price tag of about 16 16 million dollars so one six uh million um to fully implement it it could have been done in phases um and <clears throat> so we had applied for some grants for this program for uh for to implement this and ultimately, the city decided at the time to not move forward with this just uh, because of the cost. Um, and uh, we got some grants right at the beginning of the pandemic uh, that we ended up not accepting because we had bigger fish to fry by that point um, in dealing with the pandemic as a city. And thankfully, we're, you know, uh, well, we're not out of it yet, but we're, uh, <laughs> you know, we're progressing. Um, so that's kind of the, the history behind Portland Landing. I'll talk in a little bit uh, about what we ended up, we, what we did end up doing on that site, because we didn't do nothing. Uh, we did something and kind of got a start on what we're talking about today. But I'll pass back over to Christine in the meantime. Great. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, so this shows, um, again, our locust map showing the Portland Harbor Common Area. Uh, which is a, a, a wider uh, geographic extent uh, than the Portland Landing Plan that, uh, that Ethan just uh, gave a, a quick summary of, uh, but kind of shows you the, the, the range of it. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the city was, um, uh, I'm just gonna say, I, my, um, I think the title's cut off a little bit there, but it says plat platform for a new Portland Harbor Common at the top. There we go. And, um, and this came about um, a couple of years ago, the city was approached by a, a group of volunteers eager to see Eastern Waterfront open space planning continue and succeed. Uh, they'd followed that, the Portland landing process as well. Uh, and they came forward for some ideas to the city about uh, perhaps a different way to frame some of these questions. And this group includes um, Richard Beringer, Beringer uh, with the Muskie School of Public Service, uh, Patrick Costin with Canal 5 Studio, Michael Boucher and Amy, Mc, Mc, Amy Magida from Michael Boucher Landscape Architecture and Barry Chef with Woodard and Curran. Um, and they uh, engaged uh, the city not to, not to uh, provide a final design, uh, but to sort of have an exercise about how we might think not just of that Portland area, landing area, but an even wider sort of sweep of the Eastern waterfront uh, through a slightly different lens. Um, and the end product of that discussion, it, it was not meant to be an end. It was not meant to be a final design. It doesn't show all the um, programming or policies for those spaces. Uh, and as many have pointed out, Sail Main is not uh, shown on there, and that is not to rule out uh, Sail Main uh, as a feature uh, down here. But a lot of specifics weren't included. Some were, uh, but where, where there were specifics, some of those, uh, such as a pier that's shown on here, um, have already have already changed. Uh, I think uh, this plan tried to acknowledge that some of these program elements may 
uh, may ultimately move uh, over time. And we're already seeing uh, a little of that uh, now. But I think what it does, and I will say, you know, we're not going through the whole Portland Harbor Common Plan like we did uh, at that first meeting, but it's a wonderful document. It's a wonderful presentation that really talks about this in the context of what are the recipes, what are the, the sort of elements of successful urban walking, working waterfronts around the world. And it really brings um, that lens uh, of trying to distill what some of those elements are. And I think what this does um, is, is, one, it compels a fresh discussion. Let's, let's have this discussion again. Let's make sure um, regardless of what's, uh, what else, what we've decided to short-term do with that Portland landing plan, uh, that this ball stays in the air and an active, as a part of an active public dialogue. It also, uh, again, extends the range. So that is uh, sort of exciting too, from a sort of physical, uh, just a sheerly physical perspective. It, it kind of extends the area that we could envision uh, for public access. And it presents elements, and I think this is critical, that are simple enough to be relatively affordable, and that's relative, uh, that lend themselves to phasing and flexibility. And I think this is a tremendously helpful part of this plan as we um, think about how we start to uh, implement uh, part of, you know, some of our goals uh, down on the Eastern waterfront for public spaces. Um, I'm gonna, with that, I think that's enough sort of a nod of that, that big picture of how we've uh, approached uh, the Eastern Waterfront right up through Portland Harbor Common. Um, but I think it would be helpful now to talk about some of the efforts uh, around implementation, uh, not just phase one, but a couple other things as well. With that, I'm gonna pass it uh, back to Ethan to talk about the Amethyst Lab. Great. Um... Yeah, so outlined in purple, uh, you'll see uh, it's a former uh, parking lot uh, known as the Amethyst Lot uh, that was named after a couple of offshore oil rigs that were built there when um, Bath Iron Works occupied that site. Um, but the name has stuck. We're looking for a better name uh, and we're open to suggestions. Uh, so, uh, so the purple area outlines that space and that was part of uh, the, the um, Portland Landing Plan uh, and is also, you know, included in this greater Portland Harbor, Harbor Common vision. So in the meantime, we wanted to do something uh, on this space. We didn't want yet another plan to come and go and not be implemented, at least in some form. So uh, we did, in the end, uh, decide to move forward with um, what I call semi-permanent uh, changes and improvements at Amethyst to transform it from a parking lot into a public space in a public space that feels like a park and uh, gets people down close to the water. Um, so Samara, can you move forward one slide? Um, so using money that we had uh, set aside for design fees uh, for the Greater Portland Landing project, we, um, when, when it became clear we weren't gonna move forward with that project, uh, the full uh, project for Portland Landing, we took those uh, design fees and went ahead and implemented a semi-permanent park uh, in this space. And that's what you're looking at here. Uh, the left-hand picture is what it looked like before. Uh, it's basically just a parking lot, um, uh, which is valuable. Uh, that is a valuable use of uh, property in Portland, but uh, not the only use. Um, and on the right, you can see some of the improvements uh, that we ended up putting in. Um, we didn't have a lot of money to work with. This is about three hundred thousand um, dollars, but uh, the the parking lot itself was in horrible shape. Uh, the so it, the whole thing or whatever was going to remain asphalt had to be repaved because it was full of potholes. You got a lot of sinkholes along the waterfront, um, and uh, it, it's a rough environment. A lot of salt and uh, salt water and and pavement doesn't do well down there. So. Um, part of it was repaving areas that we wanted to stay paved, but we were able to accomplish some of the goals that the, port, the bigger Portland landing plan was trying to accomplish too. We just did it on a smaller and cheaper scale. So using recycled materials, you know, all the granite you're seeing here was recycled from other city projects when we were pulling up curbs. Um, uh, for sidewalk projects or street projects, we would stockpile them. Uh, we've got piles of them around the city and we reuse them in playgrounds and, and parks and various things. So we were able to, almost all the granite you see was uh, recycled. 
Yeah, we incorporated native trees and native plants, and there's really beautiful splashes of color down there now where it used to be uh, uh, in monarch butterflies, uh, where it used to be just a, um, a parking lot. Uh, and, you know, you see the, the red uh, hanging bench swings down there. So there's places to sit, places to gather. Um, some things not shown on here are, uh, you know, the waterfront trail. So the trail, you know, this provides yet another uh, travel option parallel to the Eastern Prom Trail. Uh, you can uh, take that option and go right along the water's edge now um, and get up close to the water. It includes uh, food truck plaza. So that has not been occupied by food trucks yet. Um, we have invited food trucks to um, set up shop in this location. There was a there's a big asphalt area, hardscaped area that was built just for food trucks to come and activate activate that space. And I should say, Amethyst Lot also also includes um, space for Sale Main, uh, so that Sale Main stayed in their their home uh, where they've they've been for some time. And we actually made some improvements during this project to. Uh, bring them water. They had no supply of fresh water prior to this project. And now, now uh, they've got some fresh water um, and a nice uh, turnaround drop off, uh, pick up and drop off area for their students. So we see Sale Main as a, as a really great partner in that area and activates this, what is now a park space um, and activates the bay. Uh, so that's great. Um, so in my mind, you know, just in closing on the, what we accomplished as a city at the Amethyst slot, I almost look at that as phase 1A of uh, improving uh, the waterfront and what we're talking now is, or the eastern waterfront, and what we're talking about now is, is uh, maybe 1B um, and, uh, you know, keeping that momentum forward to have public space along the water's edge. And that's it. Great, I think, Bill, you're you're up with um, with a peer update. Thank you, Christine. I'm Bill Needleman. I'm the waterfront coordinator with the Housing and Economic Development Department. I'm one of the um, last remaining city staff that's been working with this since the beginning of Christine's timeline. I think that Nan Cummings has actually been working on this since that time as well when she was with Portland Trails. Um, and as veterans of this process, uh, one of the things that's always a struggle is uh, providing active use of the water, um, getting not just the ambiance of a waterfront community, um, but the activities. Clearly, Sale Maine does that for their clientele. Um, we're looking to expand public boating options uh, in the eastern waterfront. These, this would benefit islanders and the voting public in general. Um, if we could just go move forward. Uh, the star area is where we're looking at. This is looking from Moontide Park towards the Ocean Gateway building, uh, often known as the Paint Building. Uh, it's where Narrow Gauge Rail currently has uh, their temporary um, um, offices and uh, conducts business. Um, and there's a nice piece of water in there for a public landing. Uh, the proposal, would use recycled concrete floats that have previously been owned by the Coast Guard and have been donated to the city and install them uh, parallel with shore um, to provide uh, transient birthing. This would be birthing that would be available for tie-up, um, which is a, um, a, a rare commodity on Portland's waterfront. Currently, right now, one has to go to the uh, Main State Pier uh, for uh, tie up. Uh, there's four or five spaces you can get in there depending on the size of the boats. This would be 240 feet of new tie up. Uh, we're currently seeking the funds to do this. Um, and it looks as though we have good support from city leadership. Um, we are, um, because we recognize that the pandemic increased the demand for private boating um, tremendously. Uh, it was a great pandemic safe activity for families and the demand for boating increased exponentially. And we also know that islanders often use private vessels and they really have very limited opportunities. So this is just one example of where we're trying to do something that's an increment 
Uh, it is a modest increment, but I think would have a very large impact for the voting public and the island public. And it also helps to activate the space. We've heard from commercial lobstermen and others that they're looking for places where they can tie up close to um, the transportation network on the land in Portland, uh, on the Portland Peninsula. Um, and this would be available to water taxis and other uh, smaller scale commercial activities as well. But primarily this would be a public dock uh, for public tie up as well as pick up and drop off um, for Islanders, water taxis and others. And we look forward to um, getting this implemented in, the, in, in hopefully the very near term. Thank you. Christine, if I can just jump in with one comment, uh, just on uh, before we move on on the uh, amethyst, just backing up to the amethyst and uh, and this uh, proposed landing um, that uh, that Bill is working on. Um, you know, one of the one thing I failed to mention is you know one of the reasons for moving forward with making temporary improvements there uh, or semi permanent improvements, even though we we knew it may not be the final incarnation of what that park space would look like. Um, you know, it, it's nothing that couldn't be undone in, in uh, 10 years or five years down the road if we decide we want to see something bigger and better or, or, or different there. Um, but, you know, when you look at the area <clears throat> surrounding there, there is, you know, an incredible amount of uh, development, which is positive in many ways for Portland. Um, you know, whether it's uh, businesses, hotels, parking lots um, and, and other types of development down there. But I think many city departments agreed and the city leadership agreed that it was really important to preserve a piece of this waterfront for the public, uh, for whatever future uses uh, can be um, done in a park, uh, but a place for the nearby residents to gather. Um, and there are a wide variety of different uh, uh, residents uh, in that area from public housing to higher income, um, housing to visitors and anybody who happens to be using the Eastern Prom Trail, uh, of which we have about 350,000 annual um, users on that trail. So, you know, it, the, re the reason to move forward and transform that into a park was really to get a toehold for the public, a people's place um, that would be forever uh, preserved and can be improved upon in the future, so. Great, thanks for for going back to that, Ethan. That was that was uh, good to hear. We're now we're gonna now transition into phase one, and so phase one again is that red circle to the to the left of the aerial photo we're looking at, uh, and it is roughly uh, well, it is sandwiched between uh, Main State Pier and Ocean Gateway, uh, and. Let's move on to the next slide, which shows us existing conditions. So existing condition right now, uh, it, it was temporarily made a parking lot. Uh, that was always, it was always considered a sort of temporary interim use uh, after there was no need uh, to maintain the queuing lanes that this space had been set aside for, for the um, international uh, ferry uh, and to not just leave this, this um, this parking area uh, or this area of pavement uh, not in use uh, while we thought about um, repurposing it for its next life. So those are uh, three images of uh, current state. Uh, next slide. So at the last meeting, uh, we showed this image, which is um, which shows a uh, park over a portion of that area. It reserves uh, space to the east and west, to the left and the right for um, functional uh, operational needs of um, Main State Pier and, and Ocean Gateway, making sure that we are maintaining the needs of our working waterfront while weaving uh, op open park space uh, into this area as well. And this, this diagram was deliberately simple for a couple of reasons. One, uh, to not over, just over prescribe the details uh, of the design before we had uh, heard uh, from the public. This is putting an idea uh, a little more formulated than, than sort of the big concept plan, starting to sort of drill into phase one uh, and think about what would be um, 
the really critical elements here to change uh, to change this space into something that can be accessed by everyone. And uh, another reason why it was deliberately simple uh, would be because I think um, one of the goals for this is uh, to have a fairly you know attainable, uh, relatively simple to to implement plan. Uh, that we know we can um, move forward to. And so it, it was really sort of kept minimalist uh, as a starting point, uh, as we think about phase one, uh, not entirely different from uh, some of uh, the thinking that went in to converting the amethyst lot uh, into open space as well. However, we have heard, we've gotten some initial input uh, and there was some thinking about some elements that were really important here uh, over the last couple of months, we've heard a number of things. If we could go to the next slide. I think some of the elements kind of baked into to the plan even so far, uh, and we're still hearing things and, and, and we've heard more than this. So the next slide, we'll get into some of the other things we've heard, but here's some critical elements that we're still, certainly the, the path lines you see there, uh, we know paths through this are really important uh, and certain directions for them and, and, and general locations are important, certainly final design and layout um, uh, uh, through that area uh, still being worked on. Seating areas, uh, simple seating areas like uh, those granite areas in Amethyst Park uh, are a great example of what might be appropriate here. Uh, native plantings, both, um, both for aesthetic value, but also for uh, coastal resilience uh, and improving the environmental quality of this lot, which the greening of the lot will do as well. Uh, and shade trees help uh, that, um, that go along too. Uh, and much of this area is sort of anticipated to be um, uh, open lawn as well for people to, to do sort of uh, passive recreation too. Um, and there is some uh, stabilizing of uh, the water's edge anticipated with this phase as well to make sure it's uh, structurally sound. Um, so those are some elements currently in play that we anticipate being part of phase one and attainable at, as part of phase one. Uh, and important uh, to its success. Um, next slide shows some other things we've heard. Some of the things we've heard uh, are certainly, are uh, we're showing on that plan now. Some we're still processing. Some um, might um, be part of sort of a later design phase as well. And those include sort of emphasis on planning for working waterfront needs, which we are highly aware of the need for. Uh, funding questions, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about now. It's its context and of its location in a pretty highly trafficked uh, corridor of the city, coastal resilience, public art, which we haven't really talked about, but I think there's there's time and room in this design uh, to have later conversations about public art as well. Island parking, of course, um, how it might mesh with the other properties, including the uh, Portland Foresight, the former Portland company, and uh, which is also planning open space privately owned and making sure that feels kind of seamless and works well together. Um, and those, those are some of the highlights. I'm, not sure, I'm sure I did not capture everything. Of course, community boating, Sale, Maine uh, was a highlight of that meeting. And I hope we have um, uh, adequately addressed that uh, so far tonight, but we're happy to talk about it a little more uh, in the Q&A in the uh, as well. Um, so that's where we are with public input on phase one so far in this process coming off of the first meeting. Uh, earlier this summer, and we are eager, uh, we're eager to hear more at the end of the meeting on, on people's thoughts, uh, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns about the space. With that, I re may raised uh, the issue of costs and funding having coming up, uh, having come up, uh, and I'm going to uh, look to Ethan uh, to walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, so what you're looking at here, uh, the you know this is for you know the phase one of the Greater uh, Portland Harbor Portland Harbor Common Project. We think this um, you know to do simple improvements here is going to be upwards of two million dollars. We don't have a final price tag though because we haven't done the design work and incorporated all any of the public feedback we're getting um, into what people want to see here. Um, so that could go up or down. Um, so yeah, that's just very preliminary and really based on similar uh, things we've done elsewhere. Um, what are the sources of that funding? Uh, you know, potentially city funds, whether it's uh, through capital improvement monies or other funding. Um, 
the Parks Conservancy fundraising that we heard about earlier, uh, working with NAN and our partners at the Parks Conservancy to do a capital campaign to, um, to help uh, build this public space, which is um, a, wonderful to have that support and option. Uh, and the third option is grants. There's federal grants uh, and state grants, um, pretty sizable, uh, that support outdoor recreation and acquiring or developing um, new parkland. Um, those are great programs. We're very experienced with uh, applying for those and have been the recipient of those many times. Uh, here in Portland, we're working on a couple right now uh, um, with various pro federal grant programs. The only drawback with those federal programs is they they take a very long time uh, to both apply for and then the turnaround to hear back is sometimes 18 or 24 months. Um, so you can't act very quickly um, if there's a desire to act quickly. Um, and other methods may be, may be a little faster at funding things. So that's uh, kind of where we're at with the, the, the funding. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. I think I'm supposed to talk about this too. Uh, yeah, the, and we're, you know, people may ask, okay, what's next? Um, well, we're here tonight to hear more questions and ideas and get some more initial input um, and incorporate that into this kind of initial um, conceptual design phase. Fundraising can start uh, fairly uh, soon, but uh, one of the major things that we need to do in the in the near future is do an RFP for design services. We need to start putting some of these ideas to paper and really getting specific about what's going where and where are we putting paths and where are the trees going and um, where seating and play area is going to be and, and all that um, and really kind of nailing those things down. We envision, you know, when we've done this before, whether it was for the Amethyst lot project or Portland Landing, there's opportunities for more input along the way. Um, this is just uh, an early phase here uh, to get some initial feedback. Um, but yeah, so we would do an RFP for design services, bring on a design team to uh, help guide that. Um, there's a significant amount of permitting that goes into a project like this as we um, uh, went through with the Amethyst project, there's state and federal permitting to build anything uh, close to the water. Um, and this will be close to the water. So that's a piece that we do need to account for. <clears throat> and then bidding it out um, and constructing it. That's kind of the phases. So we're looking well into 2022, uh, potentially 2023. Super, I think that, that brings us, um... That brings us to uh, public comment and questions. And uh, I am anticipating we'll have a few. I see one hand raised all, already or a couple going up uh, and looking forward to hearing people's thoughts. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through here and everybody who has their hand up will invite you to share your questions and um, we want to make sure everybody's heard, so we'll try to limit it to around three minutes, um, if possible. Okay, so I'm going to bring over Michael and McAllister. Just one moment. Hello, um, my name is Michael McAllister. I'm the uh, executive director at Sail Maine, uh, and I wanted to start by saying thank you um, to everyone here. Uh, from the city uh, for really hearing, I think, the sailing community at the last meeting um, and incorporating um, their, the community concerns in the presentation today. Um, we've been, we're really excited to continue to be part of the process moving forward. Um, and I guess I also just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge how thankful um, we are at Sail Maine for all the support we've had over the, like basically the last 20 years from the city of Portland, the Portland Parks Department, uh, and, you know, more recently, the um, Portland schools in supporting Sail Maine's mission uh, of accessibility to the ocean. I think a couple key tenets to that um, accessibility or equity and diversity. Um, and with these organizations help and in partnership with other um, community based organizations like Ripple Effect, Portland Community Squash, the Boys and Girls Club, Welcoming the Stranger, 
um, the Adaptive Outdoor Education Center and Special Olympics of Maine, among others, um, Sail Maine really con continues to work and develop uh, an equitable and diverse community space on the waterfront. Um, this is definitely a work in progress and we, we know we've got some work to do here, but um, we couldn't have done any of this without the city and the uh, parks department. Um, we're Again, we're really excited um, that we've been doing this for many years together and uh, look forward to being part of the process uh, going forward. And, and thank you for including us um, in, it, in, in it this far. Um, I guess my only real quick question was just a little bit, um, Ethan, maybe you touched base on the timeline. Could you break that? I don't know if you could break it out a little more um, just on the timeline for the next uh, pieces of the process. Um, and maybe, um, yeah, if you could just help me with that part, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, we uh, we don't have a specific timeline yet. Uh, we, you know, I think selecting, uh, you know, doing an RFP that can take, um, you know, for a design team that can take, you know, six six weeks to, uh, you know, a couple months, um, and then a month to get things finalized, and then start doing the doing the work. Um, you know, you've got uh, permitting that took us uh, several months uh, when we did this for Amethyst, which was a smaller scale project, although I think it's a similar amount of paperwork, it's just a bigger square footage. Um, and, uh, and then construction, you know, right now we're bidding things out and sometimes having to uh, reject the bids that we get because things are coming into uh, price too high right now. Um, so there's no guarantees on that either. So I'd say, you know, 2022 is very optimistic um, in terms of seeing something on the ground. Uh, I am an optimist and it's certainly possible, but uh, 2023 is probably more likely for construction. Okay, great. Um, so next we have Rachel, just one moment here. Hi, can you hear me okay? All right, um, I'm Rachel. I live out on Cliff Island. Um, I just want to um, point out the fact that, okay, when we're looking at the map, there's an area to the left side of the fence. You guys have labeled the fence number nine. Um, the city of Portland recently did a lottery for island residents to lot to for us to have some additional parking. Um, people who live out on the islands year round, there is virtually no parking for us. Um, we've been pushed out of uh, many of the spots in the Ocean Gateway building, the parking garage. When they, when the Wicks building came in, they took up all the parking spaces in that Ocean Gateway garage. We've lost many spaces to outdoor dining during the pandemic. So there were very few spaces left for us. So the city of Portland created this um, lottery with these spaces. And it's been essential for those of us who are living here year round, people who are commuting to their jobs, that they have a guaranteed space to leave their vehicle. So I am hoping that in this plan that you're presenting, that you will allow us to keep this area that they've set aside um, it looks like it might infringe a little bit on your um, number one, maybe, maybe not. I'm, it's hard to tell, but that red circle, we are parking in that area to the, to the um, left of the number nine fence that you show on the map. So I, I guess um, quite a few of us Islanders, this is kind of a tough time for Islanders to chime in when they're commuting. But um, yes, there it is. So the phase one circle, the red, it's just to the um, left of that red circle where we're parking currently. And um, if you walk by that parking lot anytime in this, you know, um, it's, it's packed, all those parking lots, every space is filled. So it's just, it's a challenge. And I, and I recognize the, um, on the vision board, the great ideas with the stickers and all these wonderful activities that you're presenting. But I'm also curious as to, all these people that are going to be coming in for these great activities, um, where are they going to park? So um, I don't see any reference to parking in this plan. So um, that being said, I hope you continue with the island parking lot that has been established. 
And um, I thank you for letting me share this. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Or did you want to say anything? Yeah, let me say one quick thing. Uh, I, I, we have been talking to our uh, parking director, uh, John Pavarotta. I don't believe he was able to join us tonight. Uh, we talk often, and people often, um, you know, think it's it's a, a a binary choice between you get a parking lot or you get a park. Uh, and it, I don't see it that way. You know, many of our most beautiful and beloved parks have significant parking lots in them. Uh, Eastern Prom, Deering Oaks, Payson Park, um, some parks need more parking, um, but that's not always the solution either because there are other ways to get to the parks, but for some folks that certainly is uh, a good way to get there. And we, you know, I think the city recognizes there's definitely a need for Islander parking. So in the exist, this, this current um, design plan uh, or this, this conceptual design, there's a, a large number of parking spaces that have been reserved uh, in this working draft for that very reason that we do need vehicle access both to the park but to Ocean Gateway uh, Terminal um, for events that we're hosting there as well as on the side where the um, Main State Pier is in the area that Rachel the caller was uh, referring to. So there is parking part of this plan. Uh, the final number is yet to be determined because we haven't designed it yet but um, yeah. Great. Um, Michael Murta will be next. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, good evening. This is Michael Murtaugh. I live at 118 Beacon Street in Portland, and, and I am the current chairman of the Portland Parks Commission. I wanted to express the Parks Commission's excitement and enthusiastic support for this proposed Portland Harbor Common Project as it was described to us just now by Christine Grimando, Ethan Hippel, and Bill Needleman. Portland's waterfront is a priceless asset for our community. We welcome the phased implementation plan to develop the park in successive stages as resources become available from both public and private sources. This pragmatic approach would provide upfront public access to this unique space and would establish forever the use of the space as a public park. We are also pleased to note the supporting role of the Portland Parks Conservancy. The proposed project would significantly enhance the value of the adjacent properties. We hope that the cost of the proposed Portland Harbor Common Project will be at least partially offset by the impact payments on adjacent properties, including those of the Portland Company development, whose value will be increased by the project. We wish you Godspeed and implementation of this wonderful asset for our community. Thanks, Michael. Um, Paul Drennan. Hi, good evening. Thanks for uh, a great presentation and allowing me to chime in. Uh, my name is Paul Drennan and I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of Fort Gorgeous. We're really excited about the vision for this waterfront park. It's incredible. And we're also happy to see our friends at Sail Maine shown on the plan and have them acknowledged. Um, we see children from Sail Maine and other sailing clubs at Fort Gorgeous all summer long, along with um, thousands of other vi visitors. Um, traffic is increasing at Fort Gorgeous, and there's no sign of that trend waning. We expect traffic to Fort Gorgeous to only increase over the years. So now is the time. Uh, to plan for access to the fort. And we think it would make sense uh, to connect these two city parks, Portland Harbor Common, which will feature boat access and Fort Gorgeous, which requires boat access. So uh, we're hoping that future iterations of this plan will, will mention that. Um, and we're happy to work with the city on funding needs, um, whatever it takes, but there's really no other, it's, it's just kind of seems like a no brainer to connect this park to that park. Um, I'd love to hear comment on that and just hear if there's any uh, rumblings or future plans to connect these two parks. Thank you. Um, 
if I may, this Bill Needleman again, uh, the public landing that we described, which would not be right on this phase one, but would be adjacent um, to the Ocean Gateway complex, um, it would be available for the pickup and drop off of uh, you know folks visiting Fort Gorgeous, um, you know, as it would for water taxis and others. And we think that that is the right spot for it. I know, Paul, we've talked about this many times in the past. It's got great connection to the pickup and drop off area for Ocean Gateway. So it takes that activity off of Thames Street and off of the, uh, the through traffic and uh, would provide a, a dignified and um, convenient place for people to convene and then uh, to get on a vessel and go to Fort Gorgeous. So we, we see that as integral. We may not be able to provide berthing for uh, an excursion vessel, uh, but certainly access. Yeah, understood. And um, wondering if there would be any plans for a pickup drop off at that access area? Well, the pickup and drop off already exists for Ocean Gateway. That's one of the advantages of that site. All right. All right. Thanks. Welcome, Chip. Thank you. Uh, three quick things. Uh, one, thank you to everybody who's invested all the time and effort in this. Um, maybe most especially, if I understand correctly, Nan and Bill, who go back to the beginning of all these plans. Uh, two, um, it's hard to be fully supportive when it's so conceptual still, but I want to register as a, just a Portlander my strong support for the general direction and looking forward to learning more and really appreciate also the uh, improved acknowledgement of some of the existing activation uses down there and the longtime partnership and appreciate the um, change in some of the tenor of those points since the initial meeting. Uh, and third uh, question for you all, uh, beyond the next steps that were described in the presentation tonight, um, is, there any, uh, is there any information available or when will there be information available, um, if it's even relevant, about what city bodies, if any, need to act on the awarding of the RFP or any subsequent contractual obligations? Just wondering where the uh, city staff process intersects with actual votes by the bodies, respective bodies of the city, if any. I can uh, jump in on that one. Um, well, any RFP would be uh, regulated, or so the request for proposals uh, for selecting a design firm would be regulated by our purchasing policies and our, our purchasing department. Uh, however, any project of this scale is likely gonna have multiple levels of review, uh, not only staff review, so through our planning department, um, uh, you know, for permitting and, and et cetera, but uh, the Parks Commission, you heard from the Parks Commission Chair, uh, that's an appointed uh, commission by the City Council um, that uh, reviews large scale projects. Um, and this would likely go to Council Committee and uh, that's the path we followed uh, with prior uh, plans of this size um, to get input from our elected officials, so. Okay, thank you, Chip. Um, Reed, welcome, Reed. Hi. Uh, did you just say welcome, Reed? Yes. Uh, welcome. My name is Reed Craft. I live out on Peaks Island, and uh, really, I I'm on this to support what Rachel said earlier. Uh, because parking is so difficult for us. And, uh, but I, it seems like you have planned for some parking. And as long as you at least leave the lot that's there, then I want to congratulate the, the city planning. I think, you know, more greenery is excellent. Um, uh, the boat, the boat landing does scare me if, if people are launching vessels there, because that brings a lot of, uh, big trucks with large trailers. And then where do they park? Um, but uh, is I'm just on here to bring awareness to uh, my wife, who just had a child, and uh, I wanted to say I, I feel like just a couple of spots for expectant mothers that live on the island would be huge. 
because uh, she was very pregnant all summer. And thankfully, thankfully, we got a parking spot in the, the lottery parking. And I, I just wish that I, I don't feel like women that are, you know, seven months pregnant that live on the islands should have to worry about a permit. They should just be able to go to the city hall, prove their residency and get a sticker that says like expectant mother and be able to go back and forth between the ferry and the parking lot, you know, for, for without, without having to worry about wrangling groceries and children. Um, it's, it's a, a very small, small group of people, but a, you know, a very important one. So yeah, I'm just on here to say that's wonderful. I support what you're doing and uh, maybe think of expectant mothers that take the ferry a lot and island parking. I'm, I'm in support of the hall and I appreciate everything you guys are doing. That's all, thank you very much. Just one clarification, uh, Reed, is that the, the landing that we're describing is pick up and drop off only, it's transient birthing, there'd be no launch in here. Uh, Thank and goodness. so this would be uh, comparable to the end of Main State Pier, uh, but for more of a setup like the buoy park landing. All right, good. In that, in that case, I'm happy. Uh, I, I thought it was pretty cool because uh, yeah, I got a little boat behind me and uh, at least in the summertime, it'd be nice. Um, and that's all. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Thank you. Okay, um, before I bring the last person who has their hand up, there's a follow-up question from Chip for Ethan. Um, is there a money threshold at which council or another body must approve the advertising of or award of a capital contract? Yeah, so um, yeah, I guess the answer to that is, you know, any, uh, if, the, if the city is funding the project, the city council is approving the spending of that money through if we're allocating capital improvement funds or other types of funds, the city council is approving it. If we're accepting a grant, uh, the city council is um, in, involved in accepting that grant. And if we're accepting private donations, the city council's uh, involved in accepting those donations of any, uh, of any size. So um, for previous projects we've worked on with the Parks Conservancy, you know, we, we have gone um, and had the council accept gifts uh, given to the city. So, um, yeah, so I think the answer is, you know, any city money uh, that we spend is approved ultimately by the council or money that's donated to the city is, is a, uh, officially accepted by them. So. Okay, thanks. Welcome, Kara. Hi there, this is Kara Wildrick from Portland Trails. Uh, first off, thanks for uh, doing public comments, but also uh, taking some questions. And um, of course, thanks to Nan for getting this trail going, the Eastern Prom Trail. And um, also shout out to Ethan's team. Um, we watched the full, the harvest moon come up from the park that used to be a parking lot there, Amethyst Lot, and it was amazing and I was, uh, singing your praises about uh, how wonderful it is to have that public space there next to Sail Main and next to the trail. Um, but I do have maybe a specific and maybe nerdy question, but I think it relates to some of the parking questions that have also come up. Uh, given um, that the transportation world is changing dramatically and needs to as fast as possible for climate change reasons and health reasons, um, we know there are going to be more people walking and biking and fewer people owning their own cars. Um, and this trail right now, as Ethan said, um, pre-COVID was seeing about 340,000 uses each year with spikes at the 8 to 9 a.m. noon and 4 to 6 p or, uh, 5 to 7 p.m. So that tells us this is our busiest transportation trail in the city of Portland. Um, Pre-COVID, um, we were starting to get a little concerned about conflicts of uses, you know, when you have dog walkers and kids learning to roller skate and fast moving commuters, it can get start to get tricky and just not enough treadway. So we do see that a next phase post COVID, if that's a thing, um, will <laughs> probably mean we need to widen the usable moving space and that could take a lot of different forms. Um, and we've, of course, talked with the developers adjacent about that, um, and 
they say they're considering it. So I just am wondering if there's room in the current plan for a widening of the treadway in the space of the park adjacent to the trail, since that is the start of the trail. A long-winded question, I realize. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'll jump in with a quick response. I don't know, Christine, if you have uh, something you want to say there. Uh, but you know, the the I completely agree uh, with Kara's statement that uh, the width of that trail is uh, um, it's an issue. It's a good issue in some spots, and it's a you know there's spots where we have pinch points, and uh, you, you know a lot of that trail is 12 feet wide as it you know goes around the peninsula and the eastern prom. 12 feet wide sounds pretty wide to people, but when you have two people walking side by side and a biker going one direction and a biker going the other direction and they're all there at the same time, that is a crammed situation there and collisions can uh, occur. Uh, we have certain sections of the trail that are up to 20 feet wide. Those work better. Uh, there's a little more room uh, for people to pass um, and, uh, and, and uh, have multiple uses at the same time. So. I think that's definitely a big concern. Yeah, nothing's been finalized, but I think uh, that's definitely something that should be taken into account here because this is a, actually a place where the trail does narrow. Uh, we have some trees in the in the walkway and benches, and those are great amenities, but it does make the trail a bit more uh, constrained. So this is this could be an opportunity to help with that. Yeah, the only thing I had to add, I don't I don't have uh, clarity on the 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 final answer to that question, but I, but I do welcome the question, uh, sort of bringing that in, into the mix. We didn't, we didn't, uh, I, I know, I know folks have uh, parking concerns, uh, real ones down here, but uh, it is worth um, highlighting uh, how important other ways of reaching this space are and how important that, that network is and those connections are down there and what a part of uh, Eastern Waterfront planning it is. So uh, I'm glad to have that in the mix of questions that have been raised here and, and things for us to keep talking about. Okay, I see Robert with his hand up. Uh, hi, yes, this is Robert Chinkett. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, um, I just wanted to you know speak up for the residents of the neighborhood. Um, I live in the India Street neighborhood. I'm not alone. Um, we are people. I kind of feel like the who sometimes. Um, we tend to get diminished and, and people assume, you know, we don't really live here or that we're only here part time, none of which is true. I've lived here full time for six years and I have neighbors. We're older. Um, we had a park across the street that is now gone. Um, so we've loved and enjoyed the new Amethyst Park. Um, we really appreciate that. And the fact that it was done uh, kind of on a budget, that was great. It's, it's a big improvement. Um, and, but we're very excited about the idea of having a real park there. Um, and I, I think obviously most people understand that as you know, the, the center of, of the, the waterfront, um, it's a critical place to have something that's a public amenity um, and, and not, not get wasted on something else. Um, so I just wanted to say we, we support this and we're very excited about it and hope it can move sooner rather than later. Um, I did have one question and you may have answered it. If I missed it, I'm sorry. Um, what, what is the future involvement of the, the group or consortium that created the Portland Harbor Common concept. Um, do they have any formal involvement in the continuing of this? Are they, um, are they gonna be getting funding for it or what is their role going forward? That's uh, it. Yeah, I can, I can uh, talk about that. Um, we're uh, in communication with them, uh, you know, we, we uh, and appreciate uh, the work and the vision that's been presented. Uh, at this point, the city is um, taking, you know, this is a city project uh, and it should be led by, by city staff to it, make sure that we're, you know, incorporating all the, the public input that we want to, like we would with any other city project. Um, 
But I'd say at this point, uh, you know, moving forward for the final design, the individuals and, and team that helped get us to this point would be free to uh, put in a proposal like anybody else um, to, to be that final design team and they'd be considered um, just like anybody else. Uh, and we, we appreciate everything that's been done. It's an incredible gift in, a, in many ways. Um, you know, to the city, but we can't, we're not in a position to just do a, a sole source contract, say, for a, for a project of this size, so. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, I see one, we got a couple more hands up. Um, so, Winston. Good evening, uh, I'm Winston Lumpkins. Um, I just had a few comments. Um, I go through this area every single day on the way to and from work on a bicycle. Um, I live on the East End and usually, sometimes I'll try to go, I'll go directly home, but usually I'll circle around. It's a little more pleasant by the water and everything and a little less dangerous. Um, and I do experience um, what was mentioned about the trail width, especially in the area going past this particular area. It's often very crowded and I kind of end up like, having to do a lot of weaving and slowing down and like, that's fine. Um, but, you know, sometimes you're tired after a shift at work and you just want to get home. So it, it you know, having, um, you know, considering that trail should be, you know, a safe width for a lot of people, not counting, you know, architecture features such as trees or blocks of granite <laughs> um, so that people can, you know, move in both directions in a variety of modes. Um, cause I certainly don't want to be responsible for a collision. Um, and it does seem occasionally like that section, you get through that section and it's fine. Um, so maybe, maybe that is worth thinking of. Um, the other thing that I kind of see looking at all this that I haven't heard mentioned, um, is I, I tend to think about sea level rise with any project this close to the water. Um, so I, I'm not sure what, you know, how much you all are thinking about that. Um, but it doesn't seem like the planet is on track to control that in any meaningful way. Um, so maybe, you know, not doing the most expensive thing um, in an area that's vulnerable and, you know, making sure that it isn't, you know, that what you do do isn't too vulnerable to king tides and things that we're likely to see, you know, in the next few decades. Um, and I also, I also support like boating access for Sail Main and a public wharf sounds like a great idea um, because I think, um, you know, it's good. Sail Main allows people who don't have the money to own a boat to access one. Um, and a wharf would allow people who own a boat to access downtown, which both things seem, uh, you know, useful in a multimodal transportation sort of way and learning to use things like that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. And I would just uh, I would just add that I think considerations of sea level rise and resilience in that space will certainly be part of our process going forward as we as we move forward into next stages. Uh, I don't I don't have design answers of what that will mean in that space at this point, but um, I think uh, we're all we're all aware of its location and 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 this important issue. So uh, it will certainly be one of the lenses that would be. Uh, brought to next steps to. And um, next we have George Rowe. Yay. Hi there, a couple questions real quick. Um, I can't, uh, I was a little distracted at one point uh, with uh, some part of the, the discussion about uh, some connectivity to other things in this area, but the main state pier, you know, has been contested ground for a long time with lots of different proposals. And I think that the Casco uh, Bay Ferry is getting some, as part of their uh, renovation project, something is changing with the main state pier to help that. But the rest of it, I don't think is um, being fully utilized. So I didn't know whether there was gonna be a tie-in to that. Uh, any kind of planning effort that may or may not be um, revived if we can get this pandemic under control. Um, I also wanted to ask about the, this area has part of a TIF district and 
I would assume that the TIF district would be paying for this versus the rest of the city, um, because obviously anybody in this in this area is most likely to benefit from this amenity um, first and foremost, and that's partly why we have the, these TIF districts. Um, I mean, I'm just concerned about again the rest of the city subsidizing um, this enclave and. For example, I think I read in the paper that the B&M uh, property, which used to be $6 million, and now with the new revaluation, it was going to be $12 million, is actually going to be owned by a nonprofit entity, which means from the tax assessors and property tax point of view, that whole entire uh, acreage is going to be valued at zero <laughs> uh, for purposes of, of property tax uh, contributions to the city. So I just worry about, you know, we have all this nonprofit land that is, um, you know, not helping to, to uh, contribute to the city coffers. So I just want to understand how the TIF might be contemplated as part of maybe a future, uh, you know, funding stream. Thank you, George. Uh, it's actually a really important question you just asked with regards to TIF. Um, state statute prohibits the use of TIF funding for uh, park and open space. You know, it's a it's an economic development tool, um, and so that we wouldn't be able to access the waterfront TIF. It's not one of the eligible uses that's lit, written into the city's TIF ordinance, nor would it be approved by the state if it were. Uh, so um, we're not able to access those funds through this. And so we would have to follow the, the funding mechanisms that, that Ethan described earlier. Uh, with regards to the main state pier, um, future flexibility for the main state pier is carved into that, that parking area uh, that's associated with it. Uh, you're right that the Casco Bay Lines is making improvements to the circulation that's adjacent to it. There'll be a small amount of building demolition uh, right at the northerly end of the main state pier building to allow for uh, greater flexibility for bus turnarounds and pick up and drop off in that area. Um, but we've got work to do. We've got to work on the main state pier. We've got to figure out what to do with the big blue building. There's still activity in that area. We're going to be continue to operate a deep water berth. And so the building is going to be necessary, but what configuration and what other uses go in there is still an open question. It's one of the reasons why it's important to leave some flexibility and open space that's not programmed adjacent to the building because we don't know what the future of the building is. So thank you for bringing those two things up. Thanks for answering. Oh, I don't have anybody else's hands up right now. Well, perhaps that's a good place to wrap up. Um, I'm just gonna jump in and say, uh, First of all, thank you to everyone uh, for participating uh, and offering your thoughts and ideas. I think uh, the process already feels more enriched by some of the things we've heard uh, today. And, um, and I really uh, appreciate what came out of this meeting. We, we, I, I also want to acknowledge um, that, well, one, that we will be, we are listening to things we're hearing and talking about how to incorporate uh, these, some of the elements and, and concerns that are being raised tonight uh, now or in, or, or in future phases, depending on, on where the comment lands or which part of this planet lands on. Uh, but we are um, listening and, and uh, will in, be incorporating uh, some of this feedback into future work. And I also want to recognize that there have been comments in chat as well as some questions. I think we've gotten to a lot of the questions um, but we're going to save this chat as well if we didn't get to anything so we can process if we missed anything. Uh, I know I also saw there was a, a sort of wish to participate in the future. Uh, and I'll say I, you know, we welcome that and there will be we don't have a, uh, you know, we talked about not quite having our timelines just yet. Uh, but when we are at critical timelines for sort of the next stage with an RFP uh, or design. But when we are at those points, we will uh, make sure to get the word out widely and, uh, and invite you to come back and uh, contribute again. Anything else from my colleagues here today? No, thank you very much. I, I heard some good things and uh, good feedback and it sends us in the right direction.
Thank, Thank you, to you everybody everyone. For participating. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.